Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Shereen Ash. I'm a librarian from the Marin County Free Library, and I'm really excited today uh, to welcome you to this program, Preparing for Spring Planting, um, with Carrie Pond and Janine Stilson. Um, Master Gardeners from the Marin Master Gardeners. Carrie's been a Master Gardener since 2011 and Janine since 2014. So I hope you all enjoy the program. Uh, just a little logistics about how we'll function today. I'm gonna ask everyone to stay mute. We are recording this. So um, if you wish to view it later or share it with a friend, it'll be on our website, our YouTube channel, which is, um, you can just look up Marin County Free Library on our YouTube, on YouTube, and you will find this recording in a couple of weeks, plus many other wonderful recordings. If you have questions for the speakers, you could put them in the chat and I will read them out at the end. All right. So thanks all. I am going to disappear and I'll see you at the end for question and answers. So Janine, it is all yours. Thank you, Shireen. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Carrie and I have the pleasure, uh, once again, I've had the pleasure uh, to work together on this presentation, preparing for your spring planting. Now, a lot of the topics in our presentation today can really have their own presentation, but the beauty of, of putting it all together is it kind of gives you a roadmap on uh, so that you remember your stops along the way. You may want to focus more on something at different times over the next several months, but, um, but this can give you a nice, a nice roadmap. So Carrie and I are Marin Master Gardeners. We are trained volunteers who share their knowledge with the public. And what we'll cover today uh, we'll start off with fall cover crops, and this is the perfect time to be talking about fall cover crops because our winter vegetable, uh, excuse me, our summer vegetables are looking a little weather beaten, and um, so it's a perfect time to start thinking about it. And then we'll talk about winter planting plan, tool care, pruning and dividing your perennials, a repair repairs prior to planting, and then we'll talk about what to do in early spring, indoor seed starting, soil testing, double digging, we have a little video on that to show you, amending, direct sowing, and then planting. Take it away, Carrie. And this is Carrie, by the way, she had a color <laughs> change, hair color change. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. So we're going to start talking about our cover cropping. And again, as Janine said, this is a really great time to start thinking about doing this. You want to make sure to get your cover crop in in the fall and uh, that's right around the corner. So what are the reasons for cover cropping? Uh, it increases nutrients in your soil, whether you're using a raised bed, whether you're planting in the ground, um, either one it's going to be good for. It helps protect the soil from erosion, uh, especially as the rains hopefully get started this fall. Um, you want to make sure that good soil doesn't wash away. It's great at keeping weeds out. Uh, really helps you so you don't have to uh, do all that backbreaking work pulling up your weeds. If you've got compacted soil in the ground, especially in Marin, there are a lot of places we have clay soil. Uh, this cover cropping really helps to break up uh, the compaction. Uh, it also looks better aesthetically than having bare ground and it can actually attract beneficials into your garden. So um, really great reasons to put in a cover crop. There's a place in Santa Rosa called La Ballisters and they actually uh, carry cover crops and seeds and mixes and anything else that you might find of interest there. So it's good too, because cover cropping, you kind of think about what's the reason for it. Well, we really like it because there's a specialized bacteria on the roots of legumes that take nitrogen from the atmosphere and fix it in nodules that the bacteria create on the roots of the cover crop. Um, in order to make sure this fixation occurs and that maximum growth takes place, um, the bacteria you can actually buy, this inoculant that goes with your seeds. And places that sell seeds oftentimes sell that inoculant as well. So you want to go ahead and attach that before you do your planting. And um, they're very specific. There's different inoculants for different seeds. And make sure that you ask when you buy those which one is appropriate. So what do we plant as a cover crop? Uh, grasses and legumes are the most popular things to plant. Winter wheat, oats, alfalfa, rye, annual clovers, make sure it's an annual and not a perennial, 
Nut, baba beans, bell beans, and peas are all things that are very common to put in as a cover crop. Um, the legumes release nitrogen from their roots into the soil, which we had talked about previously. So that's a beautiful picture of vetch in Janine's garden. So she put her cover crop in. This is from last year, and uh, it's really beautiful and really helpful. So some tips. Um, as I mentioned, make sure you use annuals and not perennials. You don't want those coming back every year and competing with your crop. Um, again, when purchasing the seeds, buy the inoculant to coat the legume seeds prior to planting. Okay, so another option that you might um, decide to, to go with is lasagna composting. So this is a nice option for an area that has not been a garden bed before, and you're going to turn it into one. So the lovely things about lasagna composting is it's a flexible process. There is some timing involved and you have to do a little popping underneath. But first, um, it can be done in an in, it can be done in a raised bed or an in-ground bed. Uh, but like I said, it's a good choice for an area that has not been a garden before. So it's uncomplicated. What that's what's nice about it. And it's done a little at a time as uh, materials become available. So what are we gonna have a plethora of in the next couple months? Leaves, leaves, leaves. So what we would do is several months before you wanna do the planting. So now, maybe actually after the first rain because otherwise the ground will be super hard to deal with. Um, you scalp the grass or the vegetation in the bed that you're gonna uh, use down to soil level. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna do some popping underneath uh, of that soil. So taking your spade fork, sticking it down in there and then popping the soil up a little bit, moving it forward, popping it up a little bit to get some air in there. Then you're gonna remove uh, all sorts of pernicious weeds, any blackberry, bindweed, Bermuda grass, morning glory, that kind of thing. And then you're gonna cover the area with four to six layers of newspaper or cardboard. Now, I don't know about you, but newspaper is hard to come by these days, uh, but um, there's tons of boxes. We get all sorts of deliveries now all the time. So there's cardboard galore that you can use. Um, I actually like newspaper better. It uh, de uh, degrades better. Um, I did a lasagna compost a couple of years ago and the cardboard was still kind of chunky in the soil. And then it started to look uh, too messy. So I ended up taking them out, but it's good for the time to hold things in place. Okay, then you're gonna layer with all sorts of leaves, straw, bark, other carbon material. Okay, so your dried stuff, browns versus greens. And then you're gonna just layer. So just like a lasagna, then you've got your green layer, which is gonna be uh, scraps, kitchen scraps, green produce scraps, manure. It can be uh, aged manure or it does not have to be aged manure because this process is gonna take a couple of months. And then you just add your other carbon layer. So some, uh, just some notes on um, nitrogen sources. You can use coffee grounds, like I said, manures, alfalfa pellets, fresh weeds that aren't pernicious, vegetable scraps, grass clippings is one of my favorites, cottonseed meal, that kind of thing. And other carbon options are sawdust, not too much, uh, leaves, corn stalks, pine needles. Pine needles take forever to break down, but, but they're kind of a nice, especially in acid loving soils and uh, straw, hay, and uh, small wood chips. And then you water each layer and you wait for the bounty. And in the meantime, pull weeds. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be a recurring theme here for us. <laughs> Okay, so what better way to get a jump on your spring planting than by perusing your seed catalogs. This is a really fun wintertime activity when there's nothing better to do. We have gray skies, uh, nothing better than opening your mailbox and seeing a great seed catalog. Here's some examples here of um, places that have seeds that are very applicable to our climate. Um, we have Sustainable Seed Company, Baker Creek, which you guys are probably very familiar with. They're up in Petaluma. Uh, Renee's Garden in Santa Cruz. Kitazawa Seed Company in Oakland. Adaptive Seeds in Oregon. Johnny's 
in Maine um, and Territorial Seed Company in Oregon as well. All of these are great resources uh, if you like looking at seed catalogs. So seed catalogs have been around um, since the 1800s. And here's just an example. A lot of you may recognize burpees. They were very, very popular um, for many, many years. A lot of people use them. Um, but we've got some here that were based in San Francisco. Uh, we've got a lot of California seeds here. So people have been using seed catalogs for a very, very long time, um, and they're still popular today. So planting plan. So before you get started, make sure that you do a really good site assessment. Um, when you think about where you want to plant your seeds, you have to consider the sun. And you have to think about the sun, not just in terms of where it's going to be shaded by trees, by structures, um, by everything else around it. But also when you put your plants in, some of your plants are going to grow very tall and they're going to shade out the plants in the back. So think about what your plants are going to look like when they're at their full height and plan around that. Uh, for example, tomato plants can get really tall and bushy and they can shade anything that's planted behind it if you have the wrong angle. Um, also wind, wind can be a factor, not only just with your plants being unhappy and drying out, but also blowing over things like tomato cages and supports. So make sure you put all of this into your plan when you think about it. Um, do you plant what you like to eat? Uh, that's at the, at the end of the day, that's what's really most important. You wanna be able to enjoy your garden. You put work into it, you put effort into it, you're using your precious water on it. Make sure you actually like to eat what you plant. Um, access to your space, is it easy to get to? Uh, you don't wanna to have to go down three flights of stairs and across the back 40 to get to your garden. It's just not convenient. So make it someplace where you really think you're gonna use it um, effectively. Uh, where your water source is. Again, you don't wanna to have to be dragging hoses through your planting beds. Make sure that it's gonna be convenient and easy for you to water. Um, your ROI, uh, if it's easier to get something at farmer's market or the grocery store, and it's difficult to plant, you should think about that trade-off there. So make sure it's something you're gonna really get a lot of your bang for your buck on. And tomatoes are one of those things that people feel pretty passionate that their homegrown tomatoes taste better than things that are store bought. Um, think about whether you wanna do seeds or you wanna buy transplants. Uh, you can get a lot of great little transplants at the local nurseries. And that really gives you kind of a, a quick and easy way to get your crop in the ground. Think about how many crops you wanna do, uh, whether or not you wanna do just one set of crops, whether you're gonna rotate out, uh, try to make that plan ahead of time so you use your space effectively. Uh, decide whether you're gonna put in perennials or annuals, that will change how your plan comes together. And uh, crop rotation, another important thing to consider, um, especially if you're planting in the nightshade family, so your tomatoes, potatoes, your eggplant, peppers, Things like that should not go back in the same soil year after year. Uh, it just increases your chances of getting disease. So make sure that you have good crop rotation plants. Um, also consider your pollinators. They're, they're things you can plant that are really bring those nice pollinators into your garden. Uh, just make sure that you include those when you do your plant. So where to plant? So you can do raised beds. Um, there's a lot of pros to doing raised beds. You've got a lot of control over your soil and what goes in it. Uh, a lot less weeds to pull. It's great for drainage issues because you've got it up off the ground. Um, also great for gophers if you make sure to line the bottom of your planting beds with the, the gopher wire. Um, cons are that it's more expensive um, to put in in the beginning and it's a lot more upfront work. But once you've got them in, they'll last you years and years. And uh, a lot of people have a lot of great success planting in those. And planting in the ground is easy if your soil and your drainage are good. A lot of people have problems with competing tree roots and that can really affect your crop and the production that you get off of it. So make sure to plant in an area where you don't have those problems. So containers is another great option, um, especially for people who are short on space. Uh, they're portable, they're flexible. You can move them around when you need them. Um, even to the point where if your plants need a lot of sun and you don't get sun in one area of your yard all day long, you can actually get out and move it and put it in a good spot. Um, they take up a lot less space. Um, if you have less space, it's a great option. Um, they do take more water. 
Uh, most container plants are going to dry out more quickly from the sun and the wind, and they just don't hold water as well as the ground does. So make sure to factor that in. Make sure you get the right size for the right plant. Uh, you don't want to put a tomato in a tiny one gallon container and hope to get good production off of that. So plan ahead to make sure that you give them enough space for those roots to grow. Make sure you put drainage holes in the bottom of your pot. Um, sometimes pots are sold without those and uh, that's a big mistake. So make sure you get some that have holes in the bottom. If they don't, make sure you put them in. Uh, make sure to put your supports in your pots if you need them before the plant start, starts to grow. Once the plant starts growing, sometimes it's very difficult to get those supports in without breaking your branches. So here's an example of a, of a pot with the holes drilled in. Um, I cut a screen in a circle to cover the bottom so the soil doesn't come out. Uh, there's some people who like to put rocks or pot pottery shards in the bottom. Uh, that's not quite as effective. This seems to work really well. It holds the soil in and allows really good drainage. Um, make sure between year to year you clean your pots really well. You can use one part bleach and nine parts water and scrub it out and let it dry and uh, that should be good to go for the next year. Um, again, drill holes in the bottom and uh, the screen is very, very effective. So here's a little chart on recommended container depths by plant and it tells you how much spacing they need and what the soil depth typically goes to. Uh, this information is on the, the Marin Master Gardener website, so you can feel free to peruse that. It's got a lot of great information. Um, and make sure you, if you're choosing a container, make sure you get one big enough that follows these uh, instructions here. So here's a list of vegetable varieties for container gardening. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's a lot of different things you can actually put in containers, especially these days. A lot of these are going to be a smaller variety than what you're going to get in a normal uh, garden. So these all work really well in containers for people who are limited to that. Um, and again, you can get uh, varieties on our, on our website as well. So this again um, came off the website. It's actually a veggie planting calendar. Very difficult to see here, but you'll know what to look for if you get on the website. It's on our edibles tab under veggie planting calendar. There's also an herb planting calendar. It does the exact same thing and kind of gives you an idea of what herbs should go in at what time of the year. And uh, these are a lot of great information here. So tool care. Uh, this is an area that a lot of people um, don't really follow. And it really does make a big difference. So why do we clean and sharpen our tools? Number one, they work a lot more effectively when they're clean and sharp. Number two, they're easier to use on your hands. And number three, they last a lot longer. Um, here's two examples here. We've got pruners on the right-hand side. It's a variety of different types. We've got bypass and we have the anvil type there. And then on the left-hand side, we've got a spade with a wooden handle or a hoe with a wooden handle. And we'll talk about how to clean and, and uh, take care of both of these. So what do we do? Do we have to take them apart? Yes, we really should. Um, it's probably not something you're gonna be doing consistently, but you would be shocked when you actually take your pruners apart, how much better you can actually clean it and how much dirt actually gets lodged up inside the moving parts, um, the sap, the stickiness, it's really shocking. So to clean it, what you wanna do, take it apart. It's not that difficult to do. Uh, you do need a couple small tools to do that. Clean it with a mild soap and water mix. What I do is I just get a big bucket. I put the soap and water in the bucket and I stick them in there and let them soak for a little bit. Um, you can use a steel wool or wire brush to remove all of the rust, the soil and the sap. If you don't wanna go that route and you wanna go with the, the eco option, you can soak your hand tools for a few hours in cooled, strong black tea. And that also helps to get some of that rust off of your tools. Um, you can use alcohol as well to remove the really stubborn material. Um, I use that with a little bit of a, of a rough cloth and it comes right off. And make sure you dry everything thoroughly. Don't put things back together when they're still wet. So here's an example here of the pruners that were um, obviously neglected for a very long time. 
and it's rusted, it's dull, they were old, they were sitting at the bottom of the box, and we decided, hey, we're gonna take them out and clean them up and see what a difference it is. So here it is taken apart, not that many pieces, not that difficult to do. And again, here's some ARS cleaner uh, pruners that are being taken apart as well. A uh, little bit different setup, but you can see the little tiny um, spring there in the middle and all the dirt that came out of the little tiny holes that that spring was in. It was just amazing. So sharpening, um, different types of sharpening tools for different tools. This here is a diamond jewel stick. Um, it's very small. It has different grits on each side. So you can use the rougher grit and then shift it over to using the finer grit. Um, make sure to use gloves and eye protection if you have it. You don't want the little shards coming off and hitting you. If you have a vise, it's very handy and it makes this job a little bit easier. You don't need one, but it is helpful. So for printers and loppers, use the diamond or carbon file, or you can use a whetstone. Um, bypass pruners have one beveled edge, uh, which is very different than the other pruners. So you wanna make sure that you're only filing at that angle. Um, when you look at it, you'll see the angle there. Make sure when you're sharpening in it that you're going right at that angle. Don't go across it because you'll take your edge off. And you only go in one direction on these as well. Anvil pruners can be sharpened on both sides. Uh, shovels, hose, axes, and spades, you want to use a mill file. And I'll show you a picture of that on the next slide. So the sharpening of the bypass, okay, here's the jewel stick. You can see the angle that you want to make sure you keep when you're going one direction only when you're cleaning that. And you can see the nice sharp edge that you get after you've done it. And it only takes five to 10 passes, depending on uh, how dull your tool is. Uh, but it really does make a big difference when you're finished. You'll really notice it. So the mill file, there's a picture on the top of the mill file sharpening the edge of the hoe there. And you'll see it's, don't take too much off. You can make that edge really brittle and you don't wanna do that. You just wanna get a nice edge on it. But don't do too much. Um, the mill file is a pretty rough instrument and uh, it takes a lot of material off, so be cautious. Uh, when, you have, when you're finished with your nice, sharp, clean tools, make sure to hang them up. Uh, don't let them sit on the floor. If you've got them sitting on the floor and you've got a little bit of water, uh, rust is the result of oxygen and water reacting with the metal. And that's where a lot of the rust is coming from. So try to avoid that if you can. So you wanna oil your tools when you're finished cleaning and sharpening them. Um, lubricate everything. Uh, if you wanna use linseed oil, that's a great way to go. Um, a lot of people use a WD-40, you can use machine oil. Um, that also creates great barriers, but this oil linseed oil is very effective and works well. You wanna wipe down and spray all of your joints and blades. You wanna oil the metal as well as your wood handles. And before you do your wood handles, uh, make sure and sandpaper them down. You get the splinters off, get it nice and smooth. Uh, and then you can go ahead and oil that with the linseed oil. It works on everything. Uh, let things sit for about 15 minutes and then wipe off your excess and you're good to go uh, and reassemble them. And then on the next slide, you'll see a handle. This is a, an old shovel handle. I know a lot of them aren't wood these days, but the old wood ones, there's a before, looking pretty rough, um, sanded down in the second picture and then oiled in the third picture. And uh, this actually makes a completely great feel when you have that done. And make sure to weed. <laughs> We're back to weeding again. <laughs> okay, so pruning. Um, we're only talking about this because it is part of your uh, planning for your spring garden. You want to make sure that you have all this stuff done before you are ready to go. In January, your dormant and deciduous vines, shrubs, and grasses can be pruned. Um, your blueberries, raspberries, and blackberries are very specific. So we're not going to get into a lot of detail on pruning today, but on our website, there's a ton of information on pruning, and you can go to each of these specific vines and find out how to prune them individually so you know you're doing it correctly. Fruit trees you want to hit in the early spring. Um, make sure that they're still dormant when you do this, so make sure you get them early enough 
or you can wait just until the buds come out and that way you can identify some of those non-productive branches and you know what things you'll need to prune out there. You wanna cut back your herbs. You wanna cut out your suckers and your water sprouts. This is a picture here of water sprouts on a plum tree. Um, these plum trees are all over Marin. They're high producers. This one's loaded with water sprouts. Uh, make sure to cut all those out. Those won't bear any fruit for you and they essentially just suck the energy out of the tree. So also prune back your shrubs, your trees, your vines, and any grasses that are gonna shade out the edibles that you wanna put in your garden. Um, again, you can wait to prune out the frost damage until our danger of frost has passed. And at the same time that you're doing this and you're getting in there, make sure to check for aphids and pests. It's a good time to do it. Uh, you can also divide your edible perennials. Um, perennial, perennial veggies and fruit, uh, artichokes, asparagus, blueberries, horseradish, raspberries, rhubarb, all of these things can be divided easily. Uh, herbs that should be divided are your chives, your mint, sage, tarragon, thyme, watercress. Here's a picture of some mint um, that needs to be divided. It's very hardy, as you know. So dividing perennials, you wanna start with clean tools. You wanna to have your shovel, a fork, a trowel, and pruners. You wanna sterilize your tools with a bleach solution or alcohol beforehand, make sure they're nice and clean. Pick a shady spot and a cool day. Your plants will thank you for that. Make sure they're not water stressed. Um, they should be watered the night before to make sure they're in good shape. Know what the root structure is before you start with dividing. Um, they all operate a little bit differently. You've got tubers, bulbs, and rhizomes. Those can pull apart at the breaks or you can cut them if necessary, if there's nothing obvious. Make sure you dig under the roots. And for large plants, use a shovel or fork to lift it out of the soil. For entrenched root systems, split the plant from the top down the middle. Just take a shovel and whack it right down. Take off the soil, rinse off the roots, remove any dead growth, and make sure you keep it moist until you replant it and water it thoroughly. You don't want it to be stressed. Make sure you check and repair all of your cages, your trellises and your beds before you plant. Um, it's easy to do in the wintertime when there's nothing better to do. We've got cages here. Um, there's a raised bed and uh, we also have some support. So make sure those are all in good working condition before you start planting. Also check and repair your irrigation. Wintertime is a great time to make sure that you don't have clogged emitters you don't have leaks, you don't have cracks in old tubing. Um, make sure to go through all of this before you plant. It's a lot more difficult to do after you plant. And did we forget to mention uh -huh. weeds? <laughs> There's Janine pulling weeds. <laughs> okay. Oh, so after all that work and all that prep and all that cleaning and all that weeding, early spring is here. Hurrah! Um, okay, so early spring. So what we want to do now, the weather is nice, it's cool outside, the ground is not too wet, we want to cut in our cover crop if we have planted one. So use flowers on your cover crop as a loose guide of when to cut them under. So as soon as um, you see these flowers coming out, fava beans are the most typical example, you see those lovely black and white flowers it's time, uh, it's time to consider. And this vetch here has a beautiful purple flower. It almost feels criminal to cut them all in, but that's what, that's what we do. So cut it at soil level, leave the roots. No pulling out of the cover crop. We cut it at soil level. Then you can uh, cut up the tops. If you wanna sit there, you know, it's actually kind of quite meditative. You sit there and cut up your top and you can leave it on the soil or you can add those tops to your compost pile if you have a compost system. Um, and then uh, you clean up any other debris. And then what we wanna do is cut in. So this is a picture of some clover that I'm halfway done cutting, uh, cutting down. And it's just, it's, uh, it's a beautiful smell. But anyway, so I'm cutting it all down. And then what I'm gonna do is take one of my nicely sharpened oiled shovels and and, and work it into the soil, not too much, two inches max. So I'm just gonna kind of, or I can just leave it nice and flat and then cover it with a little bit of dirt to help with the uh, decomposing. 
this looks like it will take a long time to decompose, but uh, two weeks later, I go out there and it's practically gone. It's, it's a little bit of a garden miracle. Um, okay. So we've done that. Now, we are going to think about additions to our soil and to our beds. We if it's a garden bed that we use for vegetables and fruits, it's different than a bed that just sits there with perennials in it. But because our garden beds are managed, we have to continuously add soil, think about nutrients um, being added back in. So compost, of course, is the best. There's nothing best than compost. It's, it's uh, the gardener's best friend. Think about manure, aged manure at this point, because we're in spring now, yes? Uh, no uh, green manure. Uh, green manure, that's the term, right? Aged or fresh, no fresh manure. Um, uh, and then there can be other vegetable or animal matter that has been aged that we are going to think about adding to our soils at this point. Okay. Now, in the meantime, when you're thinking about that, you've cut in your cover crop and you're thinking about what, you're, what amendments you're going to use, uh, you can start some seeds inside. So those beautiful seed catalogs that you had been kind of drooling over earlier, those seeds come and it's time to uh, get them going. So clean your seed containers if you're reusing them, soak your seeds. Of course, you're going to read the packet. I always find that I have better... Um, I have better germination when I soak my seeds. Some of them don't say to soak, some of them do, but I tend to, I tend to soak my seeds. So you plant at the suggested seed depth in the planter, and you're gonna set on a heating pad if you have one or in a sunny location. Um, I have put my seed trays on the floor in front of a window before and they get really leggy. Uh, but I found I have better luck if I put those seed trays on a table or on a chair so they're off of the cold floor where the draft is and they don't end up being as leggy. So that's something to uh, consider. Okay, so notice earlier when I said you're thinking about uh, your additions to the soil, um, but the best thing to do would be to test the soil. So uh, we think we know, I think I know because I have my own compost system. I think my soil's full of all sorts of goodies. And then I had one garden bed that would just had no nitrogen at all. And I honestly was planting and it couldn't feel like or realize or couldn't figure out why things weren't thriving. And it just didn't have any nitrogen. And I think, I think it's because the compost that I was making, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't do it right. So anywho, check your soil. You can order this set, uh, this kit right here uh, on the Marin Master Gardener website. It costs about $19 with about five or $6 shipping. So you're in for it uh, for about $25 or you can do something much more specific, um, technical is what I mean to say uh, by sending in it to a lab and you can get a lot more data that way. However, the beauty of this uh, kit is that it gives you four very important pieces of information. The three macronutrients, NPR, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, right? NPR? No, not NPR. NPK. Who's paying attention out there? <laughs> NPK. And, uh, and it also gives you the pH of your soil which is super, super important. Carrie and I have another presentation that talks all about amendments and nutrients. Uh, and we really go into depth on, on the nutrients and micronutrients and pH. And that's, that's a treat for another time. But anyway, test your soil. Okay, so it, we, we have to mention double digging and we have to mention it because it's been a great practice for many years, however, Lately, the thinking is, is don't mess up the layers that are in your garden beds because there's specific uh, things that happen at each layer. But like we were saying earlier, we intensively manage uh, or, or expect our beds to produce for us. And sometimes we need to do things uh, differently than what mother nature would do. So in favor of double digging, it helps the soil recover from our annual demands and it helps with impacted soil. 
Uh, so reasons against double digging would be, you know, plant what will grow, right? Don't force the soil to do things it doesn't want to do. And you potentially have increased erosion, increased weeds, and the carbon uh, evaporation, uh, or the carbon release rather, the nitrogen evaporation, but the carbon release. So what I'm gonna do now is stop sharing and I'm gonna show you a short video on the proper way to double dig. Okay, so hold on everybody. Here we go. And can we, can we see that Carrie, is that? We need to turn the volume up. So important in organic gardening. And today I wanna to talk about double digging. Oh. This is a technique that was invented by French market gardeners in the 19th century. The double digging technique involves loosening the soil to about double the depth of the head of a garden spade. Double digging for initial soil preparation really does a good job if your soil is compacted. But if your soil is nice and loose and loamy, you don't want to double dig because that will just disturb the earthworms. To double dig, you'll need a large tub or a wheelbarrow, a spade and a digging fork or a broad fork. Fertilizers and compost can be added at this time too, especially fertilizers with phosphorus, which moves very slowly through the soil. Double digging is hard work, but it's really the best way to loosen your soil. And it doesn't create hard pan like rototilling can. And remember, you don't have to double dig your whole garden, just the planting area. Before you double dig, make sure your soil is dry enough. To check soil moisture, dig down six inches. Grab a handful of soil and squeeze it together. If the lump you make can be crumbled easily, the soil is dry enough to double dig. If you double dig while your soil is wet, you're gonna do more harm than good. So just wait until it dries out. Mark out your bed with stakes and strings. That way you won't do more work than you need to. We're gonna dig a trench. It's gonna be the width of the bed and it's gonna be no smaller than the width of the broad fork. It's gonna be 12 inches deep. Then we're gonna put the dirt into the bucket. Okay, now for the easy part. We're gonna grab the broad fork and we're gonna loosen up the soil underneath the soil we just dug out. Oh, the soil is so nice and loose. Now's the time to add the fertilizer and now a little bit of compost. I'm gonna dig the second trench. The topsoil that I dig up from the second trench is gonna replace the topsoil from the first trench. Continue this pattern until you get to the last trench. When you're finished trenching, just add all the soil from the first trench into the last trench. So now just water your beds a little bit to let the dirt settle and you're ready for your French intensive garden and to grow organic for life. Okay, so let me get back to here. Okay, are we back to the uh, presentation? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that I love, love, love that video because it, it's clear that it's minimal mixing of layers. So the top layers stay in the top, the bottom layers stay on the bottom. And I love the example of what we talked about before, popping underneath. Um, and uh, anyway, that's something you can consider. And that's how to do it right. Okay. You just want that. Okay. So now you've gotten, you've, you've double digged or you haven't double dug and you've checked your soil and you got your lasagna compost potentially going, you've got your amendments ready. And so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're aerating also. So perfect way to do that, of course, is the lasagna compost method. And then you can also add some uh, amendments if you haven't done a lasagna situation. Uh, these following amendments 
are great for aeration. So coffee grounds, compost, gardener's best friend, earthworm castings, leaves, leaf mulch, leaf mold, particularly decomposed leaves, manure, peat moss, sawdust is pretty good and wood bark. Some inorganic uh, materials that are great for aerating your school, uh, soil, dolomite, green sand, gypsum, um, lime or limestone, perlite, pumice sand, and vermiculite. I think it's peat moss that's particularly controversial. So think about that in the organic section when we talk about peat moss. In fact, I think one of our fellow master gardeners has a presentation on the pros and cons of using peat moss, the environmental uh, factors to consider. Okay, so uh, here's my uh, compost system right here. Um, it's the tr traditional three bin. You don't have to go through all of this. Of course, you, there is so much beautiful compost you can buy, but if there's one thing you do in your garden, it's add compost every year. Okay, so avoid compaction from working it when it's too wet. And then what you wanna use is the rule of thumb, which is the 25%. So 25% um, of the planned depth so two inches of organic matter worked into a depth of eight inches. Does everybody get that? That's how much compost you're gonna use in your bed if that's the only thing you do. So you can apply fresh manure in fall or winter, aged manure in spring and summer. Um, but as far, if, if that's, um, but you wanna balance compost to mix in through that soil. Um, and just as a side note, one of my favorite mulches for a veggie bed is uh, rice straw, thanks to uh, a fellow master gardener, Rita, if you're out there, hello. And um, herbicide-free grass clippings, two of my absolute faves. Okay, so everything is percolating in the garden. Everything is getting uh, ready. And then you see our little um, striped friend digging up grubs and things like that. Um, but be sure to take a look for pests and problems. Join the club, we all have them. Here are the top 20 garden problems in Marin. So if you have any of these, you are in good company. So ants, aphids, earwigs, scale, snails, slugs, yellow jackets, we've had some of those just last night. Deer, gophers, raccoon, rats, and skunks. And then there's a few um, diseases and blights and things that affect us also. Rust is a popular one, peach leaf curl, powdery mildew, all of that. So look around and find appropriate solutions for those things so that you're catching it early. Okay, so it's time to direct seed. You've soaked your seeds a little bit and the ground has been worked. Um, your, uh, your seedlings inside or the ones that you're gonna buy, uh, maybe, are still percolating, uh, but it's time to sow outside. So timing for success. You must check your seed packets for temperature for germination or you won't uh, be successful. Um, the variety, varieties galore, just like Carrie went through earlier. It's an economical way to plant, more economical than planting seedlings. You just follow the instructions on the packet after you plant, irrigate deeply, and then you can do some thinning. Um, uh, let's see. So easy, easy. You can dig a trench like this fellow is doing here, or you can poke a hole with your finger and drop the seed in. Almost always, it's twice the length of the seed. So if you have a one inch seed, that'd be a really big seed. If you had a one inch seed, you're gonna uh, put it down two inches. Uh, or if you have little tiny seeds, you like lettuce, you can smatter them around on the top and then cover it lightly with soil. And then you can thin with scissors. Now, if you're like me, thinning is painful, just like if on your fruit trees when you thin or even in the garden when you're thinning, it's painful. But do it anyway. Make yourself do it because it helps in the long run. Okay. And then if needed or necessary, if you have trouble uh, with birds, you can cover the area with tool to protect. So just so you know, some particularly easy seeds to direct sow are beans, pumpkin, squash, and peas. 
So the large seeds and beets, carrots, parsnips, radishes, turnips, the root crops are particularly successful. Quickly maturing seeds tend to be braising mixes, lettuces, microgreens, and um, you can uh, find all that information and more on the Master Gardener website. And there's the address down there, the Master Gardener files. Okay. So then after a couple of weeks go by, you can literally walk outside and watch your garden grow. I do this every spring. It brings me so much pleasure watching them pop, pop up. Oh boy, this garden needs some attention. I think this is Carrie's garden, actually. <laughs> okay, no, it's mine, it's my garden. I need to clean it up, clean it up. So I should have done all the things that we talked about before to get it ready. Okay, so uh, now uh, you're ready for your transplants. This is the most fun thing ever. I used to uh, go into a clothing store for retail therapy, but now I go into a nursery because this is just a wonderland. Go to your favorite nursery, nursery, look at all the fun little seedlings that are available, whether they be flowers or fruits or vegetables or whatever, and um, buy to your heart's content when your beds are ready. So if you have homegrown starch, you need to harden them off. Uh, probably a week to 10 days where you're there spending the day outside so that they can get used to the heat and the cold. And so they won't have shock when they go in the ground. So gather all the supplies that you need, uh, your trowel, your gloves, all that kind of stuff. Pick a cool day. An early evening is perfect. Mark your placement. Uh, make sure your soil is moist, not wet. Dig your holes, remove your uh, starts from the pack. Lightly loosen the leaves. You don't want to do too much. You know, the Oh, gosh, when I was in high school, my, my horticulture teacher uh, taught me to take out an impacted start, cut a big X at the bottom, and then stick it in the ground. It's too traumatic for the plant. Gently loosen it up, maybe uh, coax a couple of the roots out to the side, and then put that little, uh, little guy or gal into the, into the ground. Okay. Um, then you're going to water thoroughly. Add supports at this time, just like Carrie was talking about earlier. And um, label, 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 or adjust your irrigation, all that stuff. Label, if you're like me, you think I'll remember. You won't remember, people out there. You won't remember. So label, label, label. You'll thank yourself later. Cover with tule fabric if necessary, and then keep moist. Okay, here's just some examples of some starts. Here's some covers. These are uh, rigid cone netting uh, to protect from birds. Birds are very tricky. Uh, just some ideas there. And look at these little sticks here in the tomato plants labeled. Okay, here's some additional little starts that are getting ready to go into the ground. I, I don't know if this is true, but these, the basil plants look exactly like the um, ones that I buy at Trader Joe's, <laughs> which have worked well when I planted them in, in the garden. And I don't know who's growing coffee out there, but you know, I don't know why we have that. I don't know why I have that photo in there. <laughs> and corn, here we go. Oh, here's Carrie again. She just got finished working in the garden. <laughs> and then everybody get ready for the bounty. There's nothing more uh, pleasurable than walking outside, getting your produce, coming back in and eating it with uh, yourself, with friends or whatever, but it's just a real joy. And I can tell that oh, if you all are like me, and I think you are because you're here, it's just a real, a real pleasure. So in summary, with a little bit of preparation, you can set yourself up for success. Generally, prepare in the fall, plan in the winter, set the stage in spring, and eat, eat, eat in the summertime. Questions? Hi, everyone. Um, this is Shireen again, and that was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I a lot of information. Um, 
you're looking at someone who never sharpens her gardening tools. So <laughs> I have some work to do. Um, so I just wanted to encourage everyone to put their questions in the chat. And I know that there was one. So I'm going to start with this one. So my soil is full of old roots. Do I need to get rid of those before I plant cover crops or will the roots decompose naturally? Uh, okay, so uh, the question is a good one. Are you sure they're all dead? Um, roots are a annual problem for me with near because of nearby trees, and they come back and come back. But if they're dead, um, depending on how woody they are, you could leave them there. They're going to stay there for quite some time. I would take them out. Uh, but if it's not associated with a nearby tree, then you could leave them there, especially if you're going to plan on adding, you know, six inches, it should be okay. What do you think, Carrie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We have agreement. We can mm -hmm. move to the next question, which is, is it appropriate to grow cover crop in containers, say a 10 to 15 gallon size? So this is a container gardener, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You can easily put a cover crop in there and you can even make it something that you might be able to enjoy like your peas um, something you'll actually get double usage out of. So yes, absolutely good for containers as well. That's a, a great suggestion. The next mm -hmm. question is, um, my yellow squash did not grow. It was hollow and rotted. I am wondering if there is something in the soil as I'm worried again, um, you know, planting there again. So what, what do we think about that? Hmm. So was it only, was it all the squash that was coming out of that plant? Were there any other signs um, that the plant was under stress? Have you planted squash there before? Um, if it's just one or two squash uh, that are hollow in the middle, right? That was the hollow issue. and rotted. And it said, yeah. um, the person said my yellow squash. Oh, so she adds, thank you, Linda. No other signs planted before and happened last time too. And so it sounds like when she says my yellow squash did not grow, I'm presuming the whole plant. Mm. You know, bugs can wait, make their way into a squash and they can cause rotting inside. Um, uh, but I, I... I'm not sure. It doesn't quite sound like a virus. It sounds more like a, a, a bug to me. How about you, Carrie? Either that or the soil. Maybe do that soil test and find out what's going on with the soil. That might be part of the problem too. Yeah. And that would be the more, the more, um, uh, the more elaborate soil test that you would send off to a lab, not the master gardener one that I showed here in the presentation. Thank you. Um, Another great question. What cover crops for shaded areas? What is ideal depth of, it says roasted beds, but I think that must not be right. Raised right. beds, raised, yes. Um, yeah. We don't roast our beds. Can they, be too, can they be too deep? So cover crops for shaded areas and what's the optimum um, depth for raised beds? Well, I'll do the raised beds and Janine can do the cover crop. So oh, no, no, no. I, I want the raised beds. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> raised, raised beds actually can be really deep. Um, there are places that do adaptive gardening. So people who don't want to have to bend over and get into their raised beds, and they're sometimes four feet tall. They're really easy to, to reach over and to grab things. So no, raised beds can actually be very tall. And I think there's we had a demonstration garden, I think it was at the brain injury clinic in Larkspur, oh, yeah. and they had really, really tall, beautiful raised beds that they put in, and it's easier for people to work in. So yeah, there's there's no limit, really. It's just a matter of what's what is going to work for you and how much effort and time you want to put into it. So with, with respect to a uh, shaded area for cover crops, the beauty about cover crops is they're growing through, they're grown through the winter, they're slow growing. And so they can take the cold. Um, they can also tolerate, um, what's, what's it called when the light, it's an area that has lots of light, it's just not direct. So it has tons of reflected light maybe is what I'm searching for. Um, and that should be fine. Um, but you know, underneath the redwoods, it's, it's, it's tricky. So um, I think you'll be fine if you're not in direct sun, as long as there's a lot of ambient light. Um, and uh, yeah, they should do just, they should do just fine. 
Thanks. Um, so a drought related question, are there some of these plants that require less water than others? So I, um, they aren't specific about the type of plants. Is that yeah. information on your website? Yeah, there's a lot of drought information on our website, but I will say just to throw out really quickly with tomatoes, there's a lot of people that dry farm tomatoes and the when they don't have enough water, the plant gets stressed and you end up having less production, but more flavorful fruit. And so there are places that actually do dry farm and they may give a little bit of water in the beginning and then they cut the water off once things are going and uh, you get a very, very intensely flavored fruit. Um, it's hard to do in containers because those containers really dry out quickly. Uh, you can do it in the ground if you've got the right conditions, but containers you can't do that. Um, you're going to need to water them regardless. And there's a ton of drought information on the website. A lot of people are struggling with that right now and trying to figure out, you know, what's going to be worth it with our precious water drops. Right. And, you know, in general, our fruits and vegetables are going to be uh, water. Uh, they're going to, they're thirstier than your natives, your perennials, all that stuff. So it's, a, you know, weighing things, making choices, all those, all those things. Great answers, thank you both. Um, so do I need to build a hothouse if squirrels, deer, birds, and other critters are impossible? Thinking raised beds in a good size hothouse? It's in Napa. Um, uh, it's in Napa. Um, I think you would, you know, if, if those things are a problem, you would definitely need to build some kind of structure. You know, we went to a, a garden once and they said, some for people, some for nature, some for people, some for nature. And so that helps me um, give a little. However, when, when those critters take 50%, 75, all of your stuff, then you have to uh, get more creative with the things you just said, a hothouse, netting, tool. I think I saw somebody ask about tool and you can get them at fabric stores. It's cheaper actually than at a garden store. You get tool at a fabric store and, and, and create uh, covers. Did you want to respond to Carrie or should I go to the next question? Oh, you can go. That's yeah. Janine answered it. It's a great answer. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so the next person asks, I have trouble finding the tiny green worms that go after Chinese cabbage, tree kale. Should I cover the plants with something when plants are small? Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. The little worms, I walk out there every morning and grab them. But if for some reason, like, um, yeah, they're the same color as the leaves. They're tricky to get off. The thing is, is that unless you cover those plants early, they're going to be on there and just grow with the plants. So, um, so yes, putting a cover on will help. Will help. Yeah. What do you think, Carrie? Well, you need to be cognizant of is if the plant needs to be pollinated and you cover your plant, um, you're gonna lock out the pollinators. So make sure you know which plants you're covering and what time, um, all good things to think about. Thank you. Um, the next question is, all my veggies were stunted. I thought it could be nitrogen and put some of that in. I bought some soil and everything became sandy and dense. I've since yanked everything out of my raised bed. Um, perhaps it's too much sun, any thoughts? Uh, probably not too much sun if you're planting sun-loving veggies. Um, they like a lot of sun. My guess is it's a soil issue. Janine? Yeah, yeah I, would, I would test my soil. Um, um, nitrogen is a great guess before doing anything else. Um, you see, I bought some soil and everything became sandy and dense. You know, you know, I would, I would test the soil and then I would add some, you know, compost is perfect for sandy and dense soils. So I'd add some of that for sure. Someone asked, does powdery mildew stay in the soil after I remove the damaged plant? My tomatoes have mildew and I'm wondering how to prevent it for the future, I presume. That's a good question. Yeah, so there's two, two things there. Some tomato plants are gonna be uh, more disease resistant than others. So you can think about that when you're buying your tomato starts and they'll be listed on there. They'll say which ones they're 
least likely to get, and you can check that. Number two, you have to do crop rotation too. Um, make sure that you're not planting it in the same place every year. Um, they say every three years to make sure that you rotate things out. You plant it one year, two years without the nightshade family, and then you can put it back in again. Janine? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, I think powdery mildew and rust, I think they, they cover those leaves and then the leaves sit on the soil. And unless you're vigilant, you, well, you need to be vigilant about cleaning up all that debris to minimize uh, the case of it in the following year. But yes, it does hang around. Thank you. So um, I just want to put out a last call for questions for a little bit. Oh, Shereen, ahead, we, have, we have one more question actually for our, our audience here. If you guys could put in the chat box topics that you think would be interesting to hear about, um, the Edibles Guild is always looking for topics that we think the public would enjoy and get a lot of use out of. So if you have thoughts on that, um, type them in the chat box. We'd love to take a look at them. And um, as the Edibles Guild is developing different presentations to give, we'd like to take all of that into account and consideration. So if you have an opportunity to do that, that would be helpful to us. Thank you for adding that in. I'm glad to know people in the Edibles Guild. <laughs> Um, so, and, and if you have any other questions now would be your time because we're going to end shortly. So um, getting some thank yous, awesome presentation, always nice to hear. And I want to um, really stress the value of um, the Marin Master Gardeners website. There's a lot of really great information and it's pertinent to us in our region. So I think that it's, um, you guys have really done a great job. There's a lot of wonderful information there. So I encourage everyone to look there as well. You can just Google well, more. The other, the other thing too, is they just updated the website. So we've got a new improved website. It's very <laughs> easy now to find the information that you're looking for. There were some broken links before that have now been fixed and they've done a really beautiful job. And we've got for the veggies and fruit, we have gross sheets on there now. So if there's something specific you're looking for, there'll be a gross sheet by vegetable and by fruit, and it will give you all of the different things to be aware of when you're trying to plant each one. And it's just loaded with great information, very easy to find. So we've got a great question. There's, is there an email that we can submit our topics of interest? I can't think of any right now, but I know someone will pop up. Is there a contact um, bit on the website? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> that is a good question. I can, I can look. Well, just in the interest of time, feel free to email me and I will forward it to Carrie. Um, and I'll put my email in here, which you should all have just because of the Zoom links went to me. But let me do that now. Um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to forward them. So it's sash at um, marincounty.org. Oh, one final question. Um, great presentation, by the way. Um, what precautions for using reclaimed water on edibles? Very timely question, I think. Yeah, we've noticed in Novato and San Rafael, they're now doing reclaimed water filling stations for people and homeowners are going in with their uh, barrels and rain catchment things and they're getting, uh, getting reclaimed water to use. You know, it's, it's a little bit of a debatable topic. We, I think we talked about this just recently last week and there are a lot of people who don't wanna use reclaimed water on food that they eat. Um, I don't know, Janine, has there been any guidance put out on that? Yeah, you know, there's, yeah, there's lots of, uh, you know, and of course, where is it reclaimed from? What's it have in it? And there's so many questions about where it came from. And especially if you're going to use it on edibles, it's a whole different ballgame if you're going to water your grass or you're going to, um, uh, your perennials and stuff like that. Um, I think we're going to need to stay tuned on that. Um, no, I don't think anyone feels comfortable enough saying use reclaimed. It, 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 there's just too many factors. Yeah. So we'll have to see. Yeah. Right. So it sounds like that's an open question at this I think point. So. Yeah. And I'm just putting the contact information, um, the website and some basic contact information for Marin Master Gardeners in the chat. Um, there's a phone number, 415-473-4204, an email, helpdesk at 
M-A-R-I-N-M-G dot O-R-G. And again, that's in the, in the chat or you can just Google them up. So I think with that, I will echo all the wonderful thank yous for a really informative and engaging presentation. It was great, a lot to take in. And uh, apparently I, for one, have a lot of work to do. So <laughs> thank you again. I hope we can all meet back here uh, soon. So stay cool everyone and enjoy your afternoon. All right. Thank you, Shireen. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. You're very welcome. Yeah. Take right. care, everyone. Bye. Bye. So long.